Dr. Hogan, we're ready for your opening statement. Did I get it? All right, it's an honor to be here in Canoga Park, California, and it's an honor to defend the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and that uh, the evolution theory, as taught in our schools, is one of the dumbest and most dangerous religions in the history of planet Earth. So to defend my position, or state my position, I believe the Bible is literally true. My name is Ken Hogan. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been doing seminars on this topic. And uh, I believe the Bible is true. Quick introduction to the family. I have a wife, uh, 31 years, been married, three kids, all married, uh, three and a half, or four now, grandchildren. Just had number four here a couple days ago. And hopefully about 20 more coming. Um, <laughs> listen, I've only got five minutes. Let's define the positions. I believe the Bible is literally true. It teaches very clearly that the earth line found all through nature. I predict there will be thousands of symbiotic relationships. The Bible teaches everything was created within six days of each other. Plants, animals, everything created in a very short time frame. Well, we find all over nature literally millions of examples of what are called symbiosis relationships where certain plants require certain animals to pollinate them or certain animals require certain plants to survive. How on earth could these things evolve independently? The evolution theory has a hard enough time getting anything to evolve, not to mention the fact that there is no evidence of anything ever, ever evolved. We don't ever see anything change. You know, dogs produce dogs every time. But yet, to get them to evolve symbiotically is absolutely ludicrous to believe something like that can happen. I predict, based on the Bible teaching that it was made in six days, there will be limits to the variations. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. And that's exactly what we see. Sure, you get a lot of varieties, big dogs and little dogs, but you never get something other than the kind. So that's the prediction. Lots of different varieties out there, but clear limits. And a five-year-old can tell you if that's a dog or, or a whale. I mean, they know the difference, okay? I predict, based on the Bible teaching, that there would be a purpose to life, a reason why we're here. Based on the assumption that the Bible is true, I think we can make the prediction that uh, the non there will be non-material things in this world, things you cannot put in a jar and hold, things like love, sense of justice, mercy, innate knowledge of right and wrong, a conscience, and absolute truth. How would any of those come about via an evolution theory, with the evolution process? Okay? I predict there'll be a way to find the will of the Creator. The Creator of this universe left behind information that we can find Him and find what He wants us to do. Maybe there'll be messengers that He'll send out like prophets and priests and preachers and evangelists. Maybe there'll be a book that He leaves behind. And I take this book right here, the Bible, to be literally true. I think Genesis is historical fact. It is not mythology as some people would teach. Okay? I predict there'll be an afterlife and an accounting one day to stand before God. The Bible teaches before the flood came, the people lived over six or over 900 years. That's what the Bible says. Now, based on that, I think that is historically accurate. They did live to be 900 years old. We can make some predictions, okay? I would predict that we'll find lots of legends of a creation story in cultures all over the world that have no influence by Christianity. And I predict we'll find evidence of cultures teaching about something what is called the Golden Age, when people used to live to be nearly a thousand. And sure enough, that is precisely what we find as we search through history and ancient cultures. They taught that there used to be a time when man lived to be a really, really old age. I predict there'll be skeletons found of people showing signs of great age, such as larger brow ridge and larger jaws. People that lived longer before the flood probably got bigger. I predict there'll be biological problems today, like wisdom teeth, which is often a problem for 60% of the American population anyway, because that's evidence man used to be larger and you needed that last tooth to come in by the time you're 18 or 20. It's not evidence of evolution, it's evidence of design that is degenerating, okay? I predict there'll be a universal longing for things to be restored to the Garden of Eden conditions. What difference does it make if you believe in evolution? Well, if evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. If the Bible is true, man brought death into the world. These two views are polar opposite. Somebody's wrong. We'll find out today. Thank you. Mr. Callahan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Rasmussen for allowing the debate and everyone on the staff has been very helpful and pleasant. Uh, Tim and Charlie and Roland Jr. I want to thank Dr. Hoven for answering my letter on his radio program and inviting me to debate. Also speaking with me on the radio show. And I've enjoyed listening to his radio show and his sense of humor. 
Um, Genesis, history or myth? I would say that it's neither history or myth, but before we address that issue, I have some low tech here compared to Dr. Hovind's high tech. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone want to take a guess? Well, this, uh, this rather evolved, sophisticated skull over here, that's a modern human skull here. Can everyone see it pretty well? And this is a female skull of a modern human. And this skull over here, which is like very brutish and primitive looking, well, that's also a modern skull, but that's a male skull. So women, if you ever thought you were living with a, a caveman, that's, uh, that's evidence. All right, the, uh, the Johnny Carson would have a little joke about that. Joke not going over as well as he thought. But at any rate, I would say that um, Janus history, it, it, it's neither, it's a model. It's a model for the physical universe and the spiritual universe and how they relate to one another. And they cor correctly identify God, Satan, and man, and many of the important relationships between the three. And through the, uh, through the ages, and especially in our modern time, this is an age of reason we're living in, which you all know, and you've all heard of the scientific me method, observation, reality, theory, and we've progressed a great deal in our knowledge of the universe and of science. We won't be able to go to the moon or send spacecraft past the, past the outer planets or detonate nuclear weapons if we didn't understand science very well in the physics. By the same token, we've also learned a great deal about um, archaeology and the Bible. And Jesus still stands the test of time. He is deity. He's God. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with Josh McDowell's famous book, Evidence That Demands Verdict. So Jesus stands as God historically and through the evidence and through the scientific method. But by the same token, we have learned a great deal about the universe. And we know that we know now that the universe is pretty much what secular scientists say it is. It's billions of years old, and it contains billions of galaxies, and and so forth. And we evolve, just as secular scientists say. Now that presents, I know, a number of issues, theological issues such as sin and death. Well, death particularly before the fall. Um, it also presents issues because there probably is life on other planets, life out somewhere in the universe. And there was animal suffering before man. So how do we reconcile that? Well, I think we have to say Satan. We know Satan's ancient. What if Satan existed before the Big Bang? There was a great spiritual universe, which we all agree on, that God created. And that fell. And then the material universe, which is fundamentally perverted, was to follow we're still sinners, we still need Christ's sacrifice. Now, there are, oh, before I go on, let me give you a little about, bit about my background. Um, I graduated from Berkeley in astronomy and physics. I worked at JPL for about a decade and in our space program and in other aerospace endeavors and top secret programs. Even worked at F-16 a little for about 20 years. I was fortunate to save and invest well enough that I was I could retire early from my career and concentrate on my ministry. Um, I was fortunate enough to co-author some papers that were published in scientific journals and also authored uh, some papers. I have them up here. Um, I wrote one of the more popular uh, freeware programs on the internet. If you've ever read on the internet, just type in Grand Tour, the all one word Grand Tour in the search engine and one of my software, well, my, my software program will come up. That was largely done at JPL. Um, there are a number of evidences uh, for creation and for evolution, and I hope to get into those soon and present them, but my time is up uh, at this point. All right, the first audience question will be directed at Dr. Hogan. Dr. Hogan, this is from James Selkirk, and the question is this, can a person believe in evolution and be saved? Can a person believe in evolution and be saved? Um, I would say I'd give that a qualified yes. Um, 
You don't go to hell because you believe in evolution. You go to hell because you're a sinner. Now, there are some people who just haven't arrived at the top of the mountain of truth yet, uh, where the Baptists are sitting. But, uh, yes, uh, it, I guess you'd have to define what you mean by evolution. As I read through Mr. Callahan's website and the things he teaches on there, uh, I, I became convinced he does believe in God, but I just I'm not convinced it's the same God as the God of the Bible. Because the God that he has, you know, required billions of years. He can't write a book that we can depend upon. So uh, I don't know I, I don't know who's saved and who's not, other than myself. But the position he has taken makes me real nervous uh, for his salvation, as as it does for others who take this position. Because when they say the word God, they're not talking about the God of the Bible, that's for sure. Uh, Osama bin, bin Laden uses the word God quite often, and he's not talking about the same God that I worship. So uh, I suppose it's possible to, uh, to believe in evolution, or to believe, uh, depending on what you mean by evolution, there are six meanings to the word. I cover that on video number four. But uh, yes, I think you could. I think they're going to be really embarrassed when they get to heaven, and God says, you numbskull, I told you what I, what I, I said what I meant in my book, and you didn't believe it, okay? So... Uh, if they go to heaven at all, they're going to be really upset that they don't uh, that they did a lot of damage to the cause of Christ instead of good. Okay. Mr. Callahan, as far as the issue of um, salvation, I have a web page and on my website, and I think I'll read it to you, and you can kind of judge for yourself my position on salvation, and it's called. Um, it's called Right With God, and this is the page. And by the way, it's my second attempt at a joke. Here's uh, what I eat for cereal, you get to see. Partly what I eat for cereal. This is my, uh, this is my ministry, faithreason.org, which just is at the end of the normal. I'll try to remind you of that. But anyway, let me read this in my quick two minutes. To be a Christian, oh, the, first, the top um, heading is, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. That's Romans 8.16. To be a Christian, one must satisfy the requirements set forth by God himself, not man. The underlying meaning behind the terminology used by men is what's important, saved by faith, grace, born again, etc. And it is the meaning behind the words which is, is uh, important and what is in a person's heart. Jesus clearly emphasized repentance and he re emphasized good works. However, he also taught us to pray continually, not just once, forgive us our sins, implying that no man ever reaches perfection. Therefore, it is the sincere desire to do what is right before God that is of utmost importance. Also, since God is a living, ever-present, and all-powerful being, it makes sense not just to talk to Him, but to listen and depend on Him too. This is partly what the conversation with Nicodemus concerned, John 3. Only if God is also infinitely good and merciful could we have such a relationship with Him. A Christian should see the personal communication, guidance, and power of God in his life. This is a miracle for the supernatural act of God. And it's the one miracle all Christians should see. So we accept his deity, we repent, we accept him into our lives. At that point, we're born again. And none of us gets it right. I have the same God you have. There's one God. It's Jesus Christ. This is from Jeff Koch. If we evolved from apes, why are there still apes? In other words, why didn't all apes become humans? Well, it's probably a similar reason that there's still creationists and everyone hasn't converted to theistic evolution yet. Um, evolution, evolution is a tree. It branches off. And just because you have things that are higher up in the tree, it doesn't mean there's not lower forms. We see representations of lower forms of animals, Bacteria were the first uh, single cell, or one of the first single cell. They're, they're still around. So in the same way, we see primitive forms that are still in existence, that have not evolved because um, environmental circumstances were not right in order for evolution to occur. Certain, um, certain species stayed within their niche and did not evolve, or evolved more in a parallel manner, did change into something quote unquote, you have a higher form like man. So that's why we still see, that's why we still see apes. I would say man did not evolve from apes or an ape-like creature. Um, all of that takes place in the imagination and in artists' imagination especially. 
Uh, there simply is no evidence. I mean, apes are still having babies, monkeys are still having babies, humans are still having babies. Uh, why don't we ever see this happen? Why do we always have to depend on long ago and far away? Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. It's nothing more. There's no evidence for it at all, uh, and so there's, there's no reason to compromise the clear teachings of, of the Scripture. Plus, there are genetic barriers that would prevent such a thing from happen, happening. And going from apes to humans is a relatively minor change, actually, compared to going from a rock to a human, which is what the evolution theory ultimately teaches. And the rock came from nothing, which is what they ultimately teach, too, at least in the textbooks that I have. And I show that on video number one and two of my series pretty clearly. So uh, the question of why do we still have apes, I know the evolutionist answer is typically, well, you know, because we do didn't come from apes, we both came from the common ancestor, but they're, they're straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. They do teach we came from an ape-like ancestor. Every one of the bits of evidence that's ever been used for this, like Lucy or uh, Neanderthal man, or I cover all that on video two of my series, all of them have been proven wrong. Uh, they'll keep something in the textbooks for years, like the Nebraska man was in there for 40 years. All they found was one tooth. One tooth. In the textbooks for 40 years as evidence for evolution, later it turned out to be the tooth of a pig. Uh, there are just many examples like that. Lucy, three feet tall, obviously a chimpanzee-type animal, not missing link. Plus, the bigger picture that they're missing totally is they always, you know, we don't see it happening today, that's for sure. So they say, well, let's look at the fossils. Let's look at the fossil record. I say, wait, wait, wait. There is no fossil record. There is no such thing as a fossil record. There are a bunch of bones in the dirt. Now, you're putting your interpretation on them, but it's not a record. There are no dates on them. And if you find bones in the dirt, you don't know those bones represent an animal that had any kids, let alone different kids. So I think evolution is purely a fairy tale. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. All right, we're going to go ahead and extend the argument for two minutes on either side. So if you'd like to uh, revisit oh, okay, some certainly. of the points thank, you made. All right, thank you. Um, I want to bring this to your attention. This is also on my website. If you go to the links, again, if you go to links at... Uh, faithreason.org. Um, one of the first links is list of creationist arguments here. And it's quite well done and it's quite exhaustive. You have a table of contacts here with a number of points. And each one of these points is then expanded. It goes over many issues, theology, biology, uh, the fossil record, etc. And it, it's many pages. It's very well done. And then you can go to a specific topic this one here is a faint, young, a faint young sun paradox, and it has the claim and the source, the response, links, so you can even do more research and acknowledgement. So it's quite excellent as far as addressing creationist arguments, which uh, Dr. Hovind just brought up as far as the lack of evidence. Um, I would take issue that there is an abundance, and the fossil record is one of the strongest evidences uh, matter of fact, 300 individuals, 300 individuals of Lucy have been found. And another excellent site which you can go to and research yourself on my links page is this is a, a hominid species timeline. It also shows many of the actual finds. And many of these have occurred within our lifetime. And what's happening is you're finding more and more intermediate points. It's all being filled in. And Dr. Hovind mentioned evidence being found. Well, the evidence is, is supporting evolution more and more. You can see the many intermediate forms that have been found. And again, many of these in our lifetime, such as uh, Lucy and the Tang baby. That was one of the early ones. And of course, Homo erectus. And as evolution, everyone can see a microevolution. We see change we see the wolf has evolved into the dog. And there are many breeds and species of dog that have evolved. Dr. Hoven, two minutes. OK. Um, the, all of the evidences that I'm aware of, and I think I've studied all of us, I can't believe he's still mentioning the Tang baby. That was proven wrong in 1973. Uh, it cannot possibly be a missing link in humans. But uh, the evidence that's really studied, like the Neanderthals, for instance, about 300 of those have been found. Their brains are larger than ours. Uh, they gave the same skull to nine different artists and said, what did it look like? They got nine different answers. What do you want it to look like? Do you want it more ape-like or more human-like? Hey, we're artists. We can do whatever you want with it, okay? Uh, Jack Cuazzo, uh, who's coming to speak at our conference this May, our creation conference, is one of the world's experts on the Neanderthals. He went to Europe and actually with an x-ray machine. He's a dentist, okay? He x-rayed the skulls of the Neanderthals that are on display over there. They let him have them and x-ray them. 
One of them had the jaw one inch out of the socket and the maxillary bones tilted out to make it look more ape-like. He said, guys, I'm a dentist. This guy wouldn't live 30 seconds. I mean, his jaw is an inch out of the socket. Put the jaw back and it becomes a normal human. Well, they tried to kill Dr. Coazzo for exposing the fraud of the Neanderthals. Uh, after the flood, the Bible says people lived to be, you know, 400 years old for a while. And it's just a biological fact that the bones of your eyebrow and the bones of your head never stop growing. So the Neanderthals were simply really old humans, people who were living probably past 200. Um, and as far as Homo erectus, that one has changed names quite a few times. Uh, Pithecanthropus erectus, I believe, was the original name of it. Uh, here's the Tang child, 1973, it was proven it cannot be a missing link. Um, so I've got all of the so-called cavemen talked about in my video number two, or you get the book by Jack Cuazzo, Buried Alive, or the book uh, uh, Bones of Contention by Marvin Lubinow, who studied all of the actual, actual uh, skeletons and said, look, these guys, these are not missing links. They're just unusual uh, monkeys or animals. Plus, I'd like to point out, obviously, finding bones in the dirt is not evidence of anything. Again, you don't know. You couldn't prove they had any children. So if the argument's about Genesis history or myth, I think Genesis stands. It's not been proven wrong by some bone you found in the dirt. Thank you. Do you believe the word day, when used by God during creation, refers to a 24-hour period? I do. I think the word day has to require a 24-hour period because of so, so many numerous examples in Scripture and in, uh, in science. There are 1,800 references to the word day in the Bible. All of them refer to a 24-hour day or the 12 hours of the day, where the Bible says, are there not 12 hours in the day? Uh, a couple examples of that, but nearly all of them are 24-hour days. Uh, some Bibles will have a footnote that says the days might be long periods of time, and they'll refer to Psalms chapter 90, where it says a thousand years is like yesterday, or 2 Peter 3, a day is as a thousand years. Well, neither one of those verses are talking about the creation. And both of them say thousand, not million or billion. It has nothing to do with the creation account. Plus, if you read through uh, uh, Genesis 1, you'll see God made the grass, the herbs, the trees on the third day. He made the sun on the fourth day. If those days are millions of years, then plants are going to die waiting for that sun to come up. Okay? Plus, the insects are made on day five. Now, the evolution theory, or the theistic evolution uh, position that uh, Mr. Callahan has taken, is totally inconsistent with the scripture, that's for sure, which is why people like him nearly always say, the Bible's a good book, but it has mistakes. No, I think the Bible's a great book without mistakes, and I think his theory has mistakes, okay? Uh, the, the, again, you go back to the symbiosis relationship. Certain, plant animals, certain animals require certain plants. Well, in this case, you've got the plants requiring the sun. The evolution theory has the sun created, uh, evolving, before the plants. The Bible has the plants created before the sun. There are many, many differences between the evolution theory and the creation theory and the Bible teaching. So no, they're absolutely incompatible, and the, clearly the days had to be normal 24-hour days, about like we enjoy today. Because uh, <coughs> not only did the scriptures teach that clearly, Exodus 20, 11, in six days, the no death before sin issue, but also just the, the uh, symbiotic relationships would say it has to be very rapid creation in just a few days. Thank you. Um. As far as a day, obviously, no, I do not believe that things were created as described, and Dr. Hoven actually pointed out a number of the inconsistencies in the creation story. And getting back to my point about uh, everyone agrees microevolution occurs, we see it right now, a matter of fact, in, in um, Africa, where tuskless elephants are evolving. Certain genetics has caused certain elephants not to have tusks, so they're not shot. And we see it over and over in laboratory. Every, so everyone concedes that. Now, the way the young Earth's creationists get around that is by saying, well, 6,000 years is such a short period of time, you're not going to see a drastic change. And even that, again, is subject to interpretation because there's a drastic change between a gray wolf and a pug dog. And there are certain insects that even have become new species. And so we do see quite a bit of change. However, again, the position is, a lot's not going to happen in six years. And yes, you're not going to see an ape evolve into a man in 6,000 six years. Now, I'm only briefly going to touch on the old earth ID, ID for intelligent design position, just briefly. But the way they get around it uh, is by saying, well, yes, the earth is old because of the overwhelming evidence. But then God stepped in at certain points. I'm prob you've probably heard the term, the God of the gaps. And then he helped things along, so to speak. And that way they get around macro evolution. But 
No, it pretty much happens the way secular scientists say it does. It's just a slow, uh, slow prog progress of evolution. Sometimes there are spurts. And getting back to the age, one of the key things is the age of the universe. And there are many arguments for and against. But one, uh, one I'd like to point out is that stars explode. And I'll probably try to revisit that because I'm about, about out of my time. But there's a certain amount of mass that will compress and ignite the center. And the soon, a, a star will take at the minimum one million years to blow up. Mr. Callahan, please stay there. You pointed out inconsistencies, and I believe that was what you started going over. Uh, one minute on each side uh, to explain the inconsistencies. Well, as, uh, as Dr. Hoven mentioned, there are sequences. There are sequences where the sun was created and then the stars were created, and there's not a clear... There's not a clear connection, and I go over the details of those actually in my book, which you can find. This is my uh, hard copy paperback, which I uh, wrote originally and, and was sold in uh, some famous science magazines like Discover and so forth. It's also completely online. A complete free version is on the line, and you can read that where I do go over the details of the inconsistencies. But I, I will get back since we met, since I started on the sun thing, which is an in, inconsistency in that the universe is old. If you take a certain amount of mass, um, it will compress and it will, it'll ignite. There's a certain amount of fuel which will then burn up. A star will explode in one million years. It's very well known. The most massive stars, it takes one million years. It's very straightforward. It's a very strong proof among many uh, that the universe is old. Dr. Hoven? Okay, I'm sure he was taught that at Berkeley, that you know, star dust can get together and form a star, but that just violates all the known laws of physics. When you try to squeeze dust together, you have problems with Boyle's gas law, as it's called. Gas and dust will not squeeze together without incredible pressure on it. Where's this energy coming from? Certainly not from the gravity within the dust itself. Nobody ever observes dust clouds get together and make solids. Plus, uh, the as it's squeezed together, the heat and pressure builds up and it drives it back apart. What he's teaching us is pure fantasy. There is no evidence for this whatsoever. Nobody's ever seen a star form. We see stars blow up all the time. That's all we observe. Last estimate are that there are 70 sextillion stars in the universe, which is 11 trillion per person. Uh, we never see one form. All we see is one blow up every 30 years or so. So no, that is, that is absolute uh, fairy tale stuff he's teaching there that we see stars forming or that stars can form even from dust. Dust doesn't get together and form solids. Doesn't happen. Violates the laws of physics. New question. Much of evolutionary theory is not scientific theory. It does not follow the scientific method to be proven. How can you as a scientist consciously back it up? Well, again, I would take issue with that. And one of the things you can study for yourself in that list of creationist arguments, and this is, as a matter of fact, the title is Many Scientists Re Reject Evolution, and it is related to your very point. Um, and I will read a little from it. Of the approximately 13 million scientists and engineers in the U.S. alone, less than 5%, some 600,000, are creationists, according to a Gallup poll. And taking into account only those working in related fields, earth and life sciences, there are about 48 480,000 scientists, but only about 700 believe in creation science or consider it a valid theory. And there's a reference here, Robinson, 1995. And again, you can look all this up for yourself on the internet. Just go to my site, go to the links page, and the list of creationist arguments. And that, that okay, this means that less than 0.15% of relative scientists believe in creationism. When you look at the science, when you study it, when it's debated in the courts, and the Supreme Court has always ruled on the side of evolution, you come to the conclusion that, again, it happened the way secular scientists say it did. And it's the same as sincerely looking at the evidence for the existence, reality, deity of Jesus. Anyone that sincerely looks at that evidence will come to the conclusion that Jesus is God and will come to the knowledge of the fundamentals of our relationship with him. It's the same thing. If you sincerely and diligently look at the evidence and the people whose life's work it is, the scientists, they overwhelmingly come to that conclusion in the same way that anyone that looks at the life of Jesus will come to the conclusion that he is God and what our relationship 
with him in. So I would take issue with it. It's the exact opposite. The overwhelming majority of scientists and it follows the scientific method and there's point after point after point and again I would encourage you to research this on your own. Okay, first I would take issue with the survey. I wouldn't buy that for one second that half a percent of the scientists believe in creation. I think the polls that I've seen show like 55%, according to the New York Times, believe in evolution, which leaves 45% who don't believe in our evolution. But it wouldn't matter. Majority opinion doesn't matter. If you went to the Soviet Union 10 years ago and did a survey, how many of you teachers believe in communism? No, oh, I do. <laughs> and they all do. Because if you don't, you go to Siberia. Okay? And here in America, if you don't bow down to the sacred cow of evolution, you go to academic Siberia. They won't publish your papers. They won't give you government grants. You won't get research grants. There is, you cannot make it in the scientific world without bowing down and kissing the cow of evolution. So it's just a matter of the same situation they had in the Soviet Union 10 years ago, only here it's based on the creation-evolution argument. It's not because there's scientific evidence, and to argue that because the majority believes something, therefore it's true, is ludicrous. All you got to do is look at the history of science and find thousands of examples where they taught things that were not true. For 2,000 years, it was taught big rocks fall faster than little rocks. <laughs> That's not true, but it was taught for 2,000 years by the majority of scientists. So I wouldn't buy the argument from majority opinion to begin with. And secondly, I would really take issue with the stats there that a half percent believe in creation. He must not know the same people that I know, because I know a lot of scientists who love the Lord and believe the Bible is literally true. Every branch of science, every branch of science was started by creationists. I would like to hear one thing the evolution theory has done for the good of science. It's not because of the evolution theory that we have computers or silicone or space shuttles. The evolution theory has nothing to do with science. It has donated nothing to the field of science. Even if it were true, it's a useless, useless theory. There's no evidence for it. It doesn't do any good to anybody. And there's no, it, it's, it's, it's not science. Thank you. Question dealing with anthropology. How did the distinct races come into existence in a short time frame if the earth is only a few thousand years old? The issue of races is covered for 15 minutes on my video, and you give me two minutes to answer this uh, on my video seven, but uh, there are four theories of where the different races, and I even hate to use the word race. Uh, there's only one race, it's called human race. There are different skin colors. You know, I would give you pictures of uh, different colors of cows and say, you know, they all have, they're, they're still cows, okay? They look the same in the meat locker and they taste the same on the hamburger. So. Uh, it's just the skin color. I, I think probably the most logical explanation for where the skin colors come from is the Tower of Babel. Because the Bible says in Genesis 10 and 11, after the flood, God divided the world by their languages, in their families, and in their nations. Apparently, the nations or nationalities were created. Twice in the book of Psalms, it mentions Egypt is the land of Ham. Most Bible scholars teach that the children of Ham, one of Noah's sons, went to Egypt and Africa was colonized by the Hamites, or the black people are the descendants of Ham. Japheth is the father of the Europeans, and Shem is the father of the Orientals. The three basic racial groups, if you can call them, or ethnic groups. Now since then, there's been a whole lot of mixing going on, and so there's a lot of different varieties and shades in between. But basically, I believe I could say from the scriptures, it started off as three basic uh, ethnic groups. Now, getting three different ethnic groups, uh, Orientals, uh, Caucasians, and blacks, from Noah, is so minor compared to getting the blacks, orientals, and whites from a rock. I mean, it's so minor. I wouldn't worry about it. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, as far as races, well, that's just an example of microevolution. What happened is the human race started in Africa, and you had dark skin because of the sun. And as some of the races fanned out, you had the lighter skin, you've probably heard this story, and so it's just an example of microevolution. You extend that over a long period of time, and you have, you have evolution, you have changes that compound, and you have macroevolution. Matter of fact, there again is an abundance of evidence. This is a trilobite fossil. It lived hundreds of millions of years ago for hundreds of millions of years itself, and then it became extinct. extinct. The planet is littered with this kind of thing. You can go to the La Brea Tar Pits and see the fossils there many fossils and many evidences. And again, research this for yourself. I would just again say the evidence is overwhelming scientifically. That's why it's taught in all our schools, uh, public institutions, and supported by the courts. As far as um, 
this country, this is a free country, I believe very strongly in the principles of this country where we have a chance to debate. This is by no means the USSR, a totalitarian state. And the very fact that evolution has withstood the scrutiny is a testament of its validity and its truth. This is by no means the USSR, and evolution is by no means um, a religion. It, it is a science and has been supported many times. Getting back to the issue of stars, since I have a little time, uh, we have observed stars, and again, we're learning more and more, Dr. Hovind mentioned in his opening statement about evidences. The evidence keeps coming, building a mountain of evidence for evolution. We have seen stars form in our latest infrared telescopes. We had one, uh, an earlier version, we have a more modern one, we see it. We see it, I believe it's the Eagle Nebula, we actually see the formation. And as far as blowing up, even if God created it without it coming together, it's still only going to last a million years. It cannot blow up sooner than a million years. It's basic, basic law of physics, very well understood. Beginning with Dr. Hoven, I'd like to extend the evidentiary argumentation for the case of microevolution for two minutes on both sides. Okay. Uh, for microevolution, let me get my slides back on there. Uh, he's mentioned several times about dogs coming from wolves. I would agree. Here's an article from uh, BBC News just recently. Uh, the origin of dogs is traced. It says, it looks as if 95% of current dogs came from just three original founding females. Hmm. It says, dogs today come in all sizes and sh all shapes and sizes, but scientists believe they evolved from just a handful of wolves tamed by humans living in or near China less than 15,000 years ago. Well, they're getting closer. Actually, they all didn't evolve from nothing. They're still, they still contain the same gene code, and uh, all dogs and wolves and coyotes are still interfertile. The Bible says they can bring forth after their kind. See, a dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth. A dog and a pine tree cannot. Okay, they're a different kind. So I think it's quite obvious where the kind level is in most cases. Okay, a child can tell you. He mentioned about the trilobite. Uh, he said, this is a trilobite which lived millions of years ago. Well, no, this is a trilobite. That's the fact. And then he went into the fantasy part of it lived millions of years ago. He mixed fantasy and fact together. Here's a human shoe print. Uh, the guy stepped on a trilobite, two of them actually. This was uh, documented by uh, Doling, Utah's Geological Survey, said this is not a fake, it's a legitimate footprint where the guy stepped on a true trilobites. Actually, trilobites, they say, live millions of years ago. I have a hard time believing that because a uh, trilobite has the most complicated eye ever. If the trilobite lived in the Cambrian period, which didn't exist, by the way, how did it have the most complicated eye ever in the history of the universe already on the first animal to evolve, or one of the first ones to evolve? Incredibly complex eye. Um, Trilobites are not index fossils. There probably are some still alive. There are quite a variety of trilobites. There are st some still alive. There certainly are isopods, which are probably a degenerate trilobite, because instead of having three lobes, they have one lobe. Up in northern Alaska at Prudhoe Bay, they suck them into their water filter all the time. I've got a jar of them in my museum. Come to Dinosaur Adventure Land, and you can see some trilobites or isopod, Baltic isopods, that were alive when they arrived in Pensacola. We couldn't keep them alive. We don't have 20 below zero temperatures. But anyway, they're, they're there. Thank you. All right. Um, well, again, Dr. Hovind just mentioned how dogs have evolved, and you can see it yourself. They reproduce 30 times faster approximately than man. So if in several thousand years we can see that evolution of a dog, and it all, it's a question of semantics. You see the breeds, you see the changes yourself, uh, whether something has changed from one species to another. But certainly the breeds have, and certainly there's a great, diff a great change in several thousand years. You extend that 30 times, to the order of hundreds of thousands, you can easily see where a man has evolved from something like Homo erectus. Again, I encourage you to go to my links page and look at this and study it for yourself. Uh, related point, again, the overwhelming scientific evidence supports this. That's why it's taught. That's why it's went off for, for many years. I mean, this has been debated, as you know, since the Scump Scopus Monkey trial and before. Um, creation is only one minor foothold, which were often reversed, like in the Kansas uh, school board. And as far as Dr. Hovind taking issue with me about the uh, numbers I quoted, again, you can research this yourself. I don't have time for brevity. I did, bring, I did actually print out the references and the actual uh, report, the Gallup report, where there are the actual statistics here. They're talking about the general population. And scientists, for obvious, I can't go into details, but you can research that yourself. Um, as far as I keep getting back to this little bits to use up my time, as far as star formation, it's extremely cold in space. 
And Boyle's law and Brownian motion, they have to do with heat energy moving molecules apart. Molecules move very slowly when they have hardly any energy. It's easy to imagine gravity causing them to condense. We actually have observed it with our latest infrared satellites and the space telescope. So, and again, stars blow up. They blow up. It takes a million for the most massive stars of 100 times or 200 times the mass of the sun. It still takes a million years. It's very well understood, the physics. It's like putting gas in your car. You know how long Time's the gas up. is going to run. Okay. If we have evolutionized, so to speak, as humans, why can't we communicate with other species? We can, and that's, that's an excellent point. How many of you own a pet? Come on now. I, I'm a cat lover. And I think when you live with an animal, and the longer you live, you go, oh my goodness, this cat suffers. Dog suffers, this cat thinks, this cat looks forward to things, it looks forward to playing, playing catch with me. And it has a brain up there, it thinks, it feels, and we can communicate. It's amazing what, you ever gone to the circus? It's amazing what animals can learn. And chimpanzees can communicate in sign language and gorillas. It's, matter, it's amazing what they can communicate and how sophisticated their brains are. It's estimated that the most intelligent animals, dolphins, parrots, and chimpanzees have an intelligence on par with a five-year-old child. You think how smart you were when you were five. So that actually is quite amazing. And they're suffering. Think of their suffering. And they're suffering before the evolution of man. It all points to a fundamental perversion of the universe to explain that. The perversion of the universe and then having the animal suffering, we can communicate with them, we can see how we came, evolved from these animals. And by the way, if you talk about, um, um, if you talk about the Garden of Eden, have you ever thought what would happen if man had not sinned? And would the animals um, you know, have stopped reproducing once they filled up the whole earth? Would man have stopped? reproducing. They said, well, it's time to stop reproducing. We still, would have had, uh, we still would have had cold at night. We still would have storms. Would there have been no earthquakes? The earth, all the fundamental laws of the universe would have had to have been drastically different for there be no suffering or death before Adam's sin. So it doesn't point to that. It points to a drastic change when Satan sinned. All right, the question was about communicating with animals. I think that the level of communication we have with animals is so vastly different than the level of communication we have with fellow humans as to be obvious to anybody. Um, the grunts and groans and uh, squeals of animals is so different than human speech where we portray thoughts to each other over great distances. Uh, also, uh, monkeys particularly, if you look at, they say, humans and apes that have a common ancestor, we've got a whole section of our brain called Broca's convolution that allows for us to speak. Monkeys don't have that. You'll never teach a monkey to speak. And by the way, the gorilla that learned all the sign language is simply conditioned response. You make this symbol, I give you cookie. Oh, yeah, that's not speech, that's not language. Okay, it's a conditioned response that took somebody thousands and thousands of hours and probably half a million cookies to get this accomplished, okay? <laughs> And when this gorilla dies, all that's going to go with it. This animal does not teach its children to do that. Humans do that. We teach our children. We build libraries. We build schools. We pass on accumulated information. No animal on the planet passes on accumulated information in the way that humans do. The, just the, the idea that speech evolved from grunts and groans of animals is just silly. Not possible. I disagree with it strongly. Dr. Hovind, I have a two-part question. In it, the first part asks, were Adam and Eve real people or mythical characters? The second part, if they were real and created, from where then came the wives of Cain and others? Okay. Yes, I believe Adam and Eve were real people. I believe Genesis is historical fact. I believe the Bible teaches very clearly that Adam lived, if you read Genesis chapter 5, Adam lived after he begat Seth 800 years and had sons and daughters. You could have a lot of kids in 800 years. Especially when you consider they had the entire world, an infinite food supply, no crowded property like here in Southern California. They did not have to pay $50,000 to buy a square foot of ground. Uh, it was free. They had the whole world. 
So they had huge families back then. Jewish tradition says they had 56 children. I don't know. It's just Jewish tradition. But uh, Adam and Eve's sons married sisters, which was very common practice for a long time and is still common practice in some cultures today. There's a tribe of people in one of the islands, uh, I think it's in the Indian Ocean, they're called the ostrich people, where they're required to marry family. Now, they've had so many degenerative problems with that, they only have two toes on their feet now. And their teeth fall out in the middle of the night while they're sleeping. They have real serious problems, you know. You see people like, even Charles Darwin married his first cousin just 150 years ago. He did that intentionally because he wanted to raise superior children. So it was, it was thought even back 150 years ago that, uh, you know, inbreeding was good. As some people thought that. Now, today we know, of course, it's pretty seriously wrong. But uh, Adam and Eve's children, here they had, marrying sisters is not a problem when you consider they had a perfect gene code. No, deform, no, dis, no defective genes like we have today. We have 3,500 defective genes. If you marry closer than a first cousin, you're asking for serious problems genetically. Uh, they had uh, uh, no other choice to marry but, but to marry a sister. You know, Adam married his own rib, so I don't see a problem with that at all. <laughs> I'm done. Um, yes, no, obviously I do not believe that Adam and Eve are literal people. Uh, but again, the Genesis story does have a lot of important lessons as far as the relationship between man, God, and Satan. And getting back to the intelligence of chimps, no, they're very intelligent, and they do pass on information. That's something we've learned. There were different cultures of chimpanzees that pass on different tool-making skills. Um, and that's well documented and it's been learned uh, by Jane Goodall uh, and other scientists. So. No, animals are very intelligent. Again, think of your pet. Think of your dog. Think of your cat. They're, they're very intelligent. We can communicate with them. And as far as um, the <coughs> Adam and Eve, no, they weren't. And we're getting back to the issue of, which I touched on just recently, as far as were there a little literal Adam and Eve, and what if they hadn't sinned? Again, you know, do we have no... A cold at night, no storms, no earthquakes, no winter, no lightning, no forest fires caused by lightning, no meteor impacts uh, that would cause death. As you know, a massive meteorite hit the earth which caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Lions don't hunt, dogs don't hunt, birds of prey don't hunt, alligators don't hunt, spiders don't hunt, T-Rex didn't hunt, sharks don't hunt, uh, snakes don't hunt. Uh, and even worse, I don't know, there was no TV. How long would it still have taken a long time to develop TV in the, in the Garden of Eden? Video games, no cell phones, etc. And the population would have exploded. We would have to say, well, let's stop. Let's, let's stop reproducing now. Same with the animals. It doesn't make sense. It would have taken a fundamental change drastically in the laws of nature. And that just doesn't happen. We don't, see, we don't see God working that way now. We don't see God change all the races into one to alleviate revil, ra, uh, racial tension. He's very reluctant to make massive changes in the natural law. And he doesn't move a mountain around before it... it all right, we will extend this two minutes on either side, but I just want to make the comment that this will be, these will be the last speeches before our five-minute break. Okay, so two minutes, starting with Dr. Hoven. Okay, um, I, I have a concern then. He said he does not believe Adam and Eve were literal, uh, which I, I knew that would be his position, but I have a question. Uh, Jesus certainly believed they were literal people. So you mentioned in, on your website and mentioned in your introduction tonight that you thought Jesus was deity, and yet it appears to me like you're saying he was either a liar or stupid because he believed in Adam and Eve. Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times, never gave one reference to not believing it, never gave one reference to it not being literally true, it was Jesus who said the creation of Adam was the beginning, Matthew 19.4, Mark 10.6. Uh, the Bible teaches clearly there was no death at all of any kind before Adam sinned. That's what it teaches. So how on earth can you say Jesus is deity when you, you, you're calling him a liar by your position? Do I get Dr. Hoven's extra time? Sure. Uh, okay, he said it. No, I'm just, he said he could have it. Add, if, I'll give you my time, but let me add one more point to that. Okay, sure, go, certainly. There it goes. When did the soul enter? If man evolved from an animal, at what point, exactly where, did the soul come into being? And, you know, assuming you believe, you mentioned it seemed to me that man needs to be saved. Exactly saved from what? And what, you know, what, when did this enter? You know, which caveman got the first soul? Okay, I actually, I discussed that on my website. I have a page, it's called The First Saved Man on Earth. 
And I also have a, a web page, What Jesus Said About the Creation Story and the Flood. Jesus, the vast amount of Jesus' words have to do with God, Satan, our relationship to God. They don't have to do with Genesis. As a matter of fact, the entire book of John does not mention Adam and Eve. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. The same was in the beginning with God, John 1.2. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, John 1.3. That's the level of understanding that is appropriate. It's not to give details when you don't understand detail. Jesus did not speak a lot about um, these things. It easily could have been figurative. It could have been exact, exactly not what He meant or writer embellishments, you can actually, I would encourage you again to read my page. As far as 19.4, all Jesus says was, he made a past uh, a comment, um, they, they were created male and female at the time of creation. Something to that effect. It's very brief and very short. There's only a few passages along those lines. They're, they're the same comment mentioned a few times uh, in the three, uh, three Gospels, not John. So, it's, it has to do with, again, evidence also. You know, you have overwhelming evidence for science, overwhelming for Jesus' deity, and also talking about evidence. There's three types of miracles, I think. There's a physical law, when physical laws are circumvented. And that happens very rarely, especially major type miracles. Um, but we, we do see them, obviously Jesus performed them. But, you know, I haven't raised too many people from the dead. And like Jesus did, and there, there aren't a lot of miracles like that. They do happen. There's coincidence miracles, or as is often called, providence miracles, where God works certain things, brings people into your life. That's another kind of miracle, which can more easily be explained. But to the believer, they know where it's coming from. It's coming from God. But I think the third type of miracle, which is perhaps the most subtle and most important, is born again. When the controversy about God being dead occurred, they asked Billy Graham, said, Billy Graham said, no, I know he's not dead because I talked to him this morning. And I talk to him every day. I feel his presence, his power, his guidance, as all of you do. That's the most subtle of the power. And God, Jesus said, talking about Jesus' word, don't go look Time for is it. Up. The kingdom of God is with you. All right, there will be a five-minute uh, stretch break. How do, you, how do you choose what part of the Bible you will believe? Through, through reason and faith. Faith and reason. In the same way that we learn any kind of knowledge, particularly in this age of reason and the scientific age, and think of the many, many things we've accomplished through science. And that wouldn't be possible, by the way, if science was not correct. I contend that religion is an area of study just as evolution is an area of study for which the scientific method can be applied. And again, I mentioned Josh McDowell's work. Our faith is not based without evidence. It is based on evidence. And one of the strongest evidence which reinforces our initial conviction is the power we see of God working in our lives and other Christians and miracles. Not only our relationship, our most subtle and strongest, but I'm sure a lot of us have seen actual physical miracles and certainly the providence types. Tremendous amount of evidence. And what types do I believe? Again, I believe through faith and reason. As God convicts me, as I use my own reason, as I compare it against what is known scientifically. So therefore, that's why I would not accept Genesis and would weigh Genesis as strongly as I would weigh the Gospels because of the reality of Jesus. And you can come to basic conclusions about what he said over and over again and they piece together. So again, it's by... Uh, the scientific method of applied to the scriptures, which I look at as a historical document. And there are other evidences beside the scriptures for Jesus' deity and his work. So I look at the scriptures and what, what I have learned, their internal validity, the validity compared against history, 
and science and through the conviction and through the conviction, yes, of the Holy Spirit. What I believe, And by the way, we all do that. Whether you believe it's inerrant or not, you still need, you don't have the Holy Spirit helping you. You're going to get it all mixed up and you all know that. We all need that to discern it and understand it. Dr. Hogan. Well, I agree with the last part. I think the Holy Spirit's told me real clearly that my position's right and his is wrong. Uh, so, yeah, I believe the Bible is literally true. Certainly the Bible claims to be perfect. The Bible claims to be inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and proof, etc. There are numerous cases where the scripture itself claims to be God's word. There are hundreds, if not thousands of times where it says, Thus saith the Lord. So, so the Bible is making the claim for perfection. He says he doesn't believe in Genesis. I understand that, okay? But Jesus certainly believed Genesis and quoted it 25 times, so he's calling Jesus a liar or stupid. I don't see any other options. And <clears throat> you cannot say the Bible is a good book. If it claims to be perfect and it's not, it's a bad book. If I claimed I was George Washington reincarnated, you would know either I was or I wasn't, okay? If I'm not George Washington reincarnated, but I'm claiming that I am, then I'm either a lunatic or I'm a liar. You can't say he's a good man. I'm a bad man. I'm lying, okay? And the Bible is a bad book. It's a horrible book because it's claiming to be perfect. And he's claiming it is not perfect. Somebody is very clearly wrong on this topic. So I think his position certainly calls Jesus a liar or stupid one and certainly calls numerous other New Testament and Old Testament writers alike liars because Genesis is quoted over 200 times in the New Testament. 25 times by Jesus, 200 times total. So his position of not believing Genesis absolutely devastates the entire Bible, which is fine. He can do that if he wants, okay? But he should not claim he believes the Bible, any part of the Bible. And he doesn't believe in Genesis because it all hinges and falls on that. Thank you. All right, I'll give uh, one minute on either side. I have two. Would that be acceptable? Two is fine. Sure. Um, Yes, as far as, uh, again, the inerrancy of the Scripture and believing in it, uh, there's an interesting uh, link also on my website. Can everyone see that okay? Faithreason.org, rather than me holding it up every now and then. There's a link about the development of the Bible. And, I, I mean, how many of you do realize that as late as 1885, that's just over 100 years ago, men were still debating what should be in the Bible. All Bibles f before that, almost all Bibles before that, contain the Apocrypha. Now, we don't have the Apocrypha. Was the Bible, when did that part become inerrant? When 1850, when people were studying an inerrant, inerrant Bible and studying the Apocrypha, they thought it was inerrant. Men decided, no, it's not. This, this just isn't inspired enough. It's not a cl close enough to God. What became the canon, it was all decided by men. You can't get away from our humanness. You have to make good decisions about what it is. And of course, I don't call Jesus stupid or a liar. I just believe... As I said, his words, of, um, as far as Genesis, were either figurative, not exactly what he said, a writer embellishments over the time. We know it was translated, etc. Also, uh, again, look at my page, what Jesus said about the creation story and the flood. And as far as man, we know man's imperfect. I mean, we've got a whole book, Ecclesiastes, did I pronounce that right? And anyway, we've got a whole book about a man's imperfection, essentially. Um, who, we all know how imperfect we are. That's the biggest lesson, how perverted we all are. We're, we're sinners. And, you know, you had David falling. You know how imperfect the apostles were. How Jesus rebuked Peter. Peter fell when Jesus went to the cross. I mean, because, because the Bible, writer of the Bible says it's perfect, that doesn't mean it's perfect. And it's like, as Dr. Hoven likes to point out, logical fallacies, that's circular reasoning. The Bible's not perfect because one of the writers says it's perfect. And then when you say, well, how do you know the writer's perfect? Well, because the Bible says it's perfect. No, they're imperfect men. Dr. Hoven, two minutes. Okay. Uh, he's mentioned they were still adding to the Bible or still deciding about the Bible in 1885. Obviously, he needs to listen to uh, your pastor's information about the King James Version and the Westcott and Hort controversy. He's referring to Westcott and Hort, the two perverts who said we need to decide about God's Word. I, w I wouldn't believe a thing those guys said. So I would stick with the King James Version for numerous reasons. Um, no, I don't think there's been a controversy at all. The Apocrypha has never been part of Scripture and never should be. It's in the Catholic Bible, and that's a mistake. It shouldn't be. There are clear contradictions in the Apocryphal books. Ecclesiasticus is the one you're referring to, or First and Second Maccabees, or these other ones. There are seven extra books in the Catholic Bible that are not Scripture. There's not a conflict among Bible believers of which books ought to be in there. 
I think the development of the Bible was complete, and uh, God, has, God promised he would preserve his word. Not only did he promise that he would give us his word and promise that it would uh, be perfect, he promised he would preserve it. And if we're to believe what Mr. Callahan is saying, he didn't do any of those things. So the question would come up to be obvious in my mind, how do we know which parts of the Bible are right? How do we know what God wants us to do? Where is God's word? If we follow his position, I think we're really, really going to be lost wandering around like a ship without a sail or an anchor. There is no such thing as right and wrong, which is what evolution ultimately leads to. If evolution is true, Adolf Hitler was right. He was just killing the ones he thought were inferior. I mean, if evolution's true, there's no such thing as right and wrong. There is no standard any place. So I take uh, strong exception to his, his teaching that uh, Genesis is wrong because he is indeed calling Jesus a liar or stupid one because Jesus quoted it all the time. Plus, God promised he would preserve it. Where is it? Don't fall into that Westcott Hort problem, whatever you do. Those guys were dead wrong. Cover that some other time. All right, Dr. Hoven, this is a uh, change of gear here. The question is, why do creationists say there was no death before the fall of man? If death of cells is part of life replenishing and renewing itself, for example, skin cells die and new ones grow. I think the creationists say there was no death before Adam sinned because uh, the Bible says there was no death before Adam sinned. Romans chapter 5 is real clear on the topic and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Plus the Bible teaches in three different places God's going to restore the earth like it used to be. People look forward to the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ when he's going to wipe away all tears, no death, no suffering. If he's going to restore the earth like it used to be, restore it to what? More death and suffering? But according to his teaching, that's what we had to begin with. That's how we got here. No, God designed the world for there to be no death, no suffering. Uh, there would not have been anything die had Adam and Eve not sinned. Nothing would have died. And uh, we cover much more on that on our video 7 about our plants alive. And no, plants are not alive. It's okay to eat a plant. You don't kill it. Uh, just pry Al Gore off the other side before you do it. But uh, the uh, plants are not living. They don't have a soul. They don't have the blood. They don't have uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So plants are not alive. But... Uh, Got off topic here. Read the question one more time. Yes, sir. Why do creationists say there was no death, no before, death let him sin. before the fall okay. of man? It's quite obvious. If God created a world with death, this is a cruel God. Was it, was it God's original plan for the lion to tear the guts out of the zebra and let it slowly suffer and die? And God looked at everything that he made and said it's very good? Today we have a world where the, Romans chapter 8, the whole world is groaning and travailing, suffering and pain. The mosquitoes are going around looking for you, and, but in the meantime, they're terrified that a frog is going to find them. Okay? And the frog, while he's waiting for that mosquito, is terrified a snake is going to find him. And the snake is terrified a hawk is going to find him. And the hawk is terrified a mosquito is going to find him. I mean, it's an endless cycle. Everything is living in fear. That is not the way God made it. And it's not the way it's going to be forever. God's going to restore it to Garden of Eden conditions. And I want you all to join me there. It's going to be a great time. Yes, um... No, I mean, as I pointed out before in this debate, it's, it would have taken a drastic change of the physical laws to get where we are to today. As I pointed out, the sun's still going to die. You know, was, was God continually replenishing the sun so that it doesn't die? There's going to be no night, day, no storms, no earthquakes, no meteorites, meteorites that hit. A complete change. And it just doesn't follow from, from the laws that we have now, uh, of physical laws and common sense, it makes more sense that it happened before the Big Bang, and that's the universe we have now. We have life on other planets. Most likely in suffering before man came into existence. So that explains that. As far, again, I want to just touch on the Bible uh, before, uh, well, with my remaining time. Again, I would encourage you to go look at my, my history of the Bible and it has right here, it's 1611 A.D., the King James Bible printed originally with all 80 books. The Apocrypha was officially removed in 1885, leaving only 66 books. And you can go through and read some of the various publications uh, of that book, of this uh, history of the Bible. Not to uh, discount Dr. Rasmussen's teaching on that Bible, on the Bible, but nevertheless, many Christians use the Bible with all, all 80 books and you can go over the, the history here. Hitler, Hitler is not evolution. 
uh, in the same way that the Inquisition is not Christianity. You can't point out one aberration and say, well, you know, that's what evolution is, or evolution couldn't have happened because Hitler uh, used it in an incorrect manner in the same way that we, you can't say that about the Inquisition and Christianity. And by, and Christianity, by the way, evolution is true. We learn about the physical and the spiritual universe. We put them together. We grow in our spiritual maturity in our understanding, understanding science. Do you believe in other life forms on other planets, i.e. aliens? If so, how do you explain God dying on the cross and not saving these other races? Uh, I think I have, I've answered that before, and, but I will elaborate on it, and I'm glad that was answered, that was asked. The evidence is pointing more and more to the fact that there most likely is life outside of this planet. Most likely, there have been a number of recent breakthroughs in our understanding of Mars. There's a good chance we're going to find life under the ice uh, of one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. And I won't go into the details there. But even if you argue just from a statistical standpoint, we know life's possible because of the physical laws of this universe because we exist. Unless we're a fluke, then there's a certain reasonable chance that it happened because we're here. And I do have a page on my website again, faithreason.org, which talks about extraterrestrials. Since we exist, there's a good chance, say there's a 50% chance of it happening over the lifetime of the universe, about 13 billion years, then there's an excellent chance there's one or two in the whole universe. Now the universe consists of 100 billion galaxies, and each galaxy is approximately 100 billion stars, large galaxies. That's a lot of stars. If you increase the probability just a little, then there's a lot. As far as salvation, I consider it very, most likely that Jesus came to other, um, other life forms like ours. No reason he could not have. And, and reach them. Some may be close, some may be farther away than us. By the way, we may, may never find another intelligent life form. But it may be, the universe may be full of them just because it is so vast. And... So we know that he came for us. We know he exists. We know by the evidence. We know that they, pro and we probably, they do exist. He's probably going to, I would, he would probably come to them, but we may never actually come in contact with one. Dr. Hoven. Okay, the idea that life exists on other planets is, is pure imagination. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. I've studied the UFO question quite a bit. Uh, been to the UFO Museum just a few weeks ago there in Roswell, New Mexico. Um, Studied it quite a bit. I've uh, read many, many books on the topic. There are some excellent books from a Christian perspective on UFOs. You might want to get this one, End Time Delusion, about UFOs, or this one, UFO 666, um, or a a Chuck Missler's book, Alien Encounters, is excellent on the subject. What happened at Area 51 in Roswell, New Mexico? Well, nobody's talking for sure. Nobody who knows is talking, but nine months later, Al Gore was born. <laughs> that is just an interesting bit of trivia, but... Uh, um, the <laughs> Cosmic Conspiracy is an awesome book on the topic. Uh, I would have to say from a scriptural perspective, no, there is no life on other planets. From a scientific perspective, I would say there simply is no evidence at all. So if somebody wants to believe on life on other planets, that's perfectly fine. However, they're, they're not talking about their science now, they're talking about their religion. And they need to admit that, okay? This is not part of science, this is part of a religion. So. UFOs, I think, fit into several categories. Misidentified natural objects, weather balloons, swamp gas, etc. Top secret government or private experiments. Hitler had a round, cra a round airplane that flew 50 years ago. Okay? Uh, satanic or demonic activity. Satan can only be one place at a time. God is all places at all times. So it may be Satan uses some kind of instantaneous or near instantaneous transportation system. It could be alien life from other planets, but I don't buy that for a second. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. So as far as if we're going to deal with science, Science is on the side of God made all of this just for us. People say, why did he make all those billions of stars? Oh, it's for what's called the oh wow factor. So we can walk outside and go, oh wow, what a mighty God we serve. Okay? Would you like to extend the time? Yeah, I would if all you, right. you wouldn't mind. As far as flying saucers, yes, we have no evidence. I did not say there was evidence. I only said that we look at the physics, we look out at the universe, it's very likely that it has happened. And scientists admit that we don't have any evidence. And that's an example of science being honest. 
There's no conspiracy to push evolution on us. It's just what the science says. And again, you can um, look at the creationist arguments on, on my website and go through some of those yourself. The evidence is overwhelming. For, and as far as things that scientists have done for us in evolution, evolution is fundamental to the understanding of biology. And one of the reasons we've made such strides in, in conquering HIV is understanding how it mutates, which is evolution. So scientists have given us great, great uh, un, um, progress and help, and it's through understanding of science and evolution is fundamental, etc. Dr. Hoven, one minute. Yes, I've heard that statement, evolution is fundamental to science. I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times. I'd like to see what's fundamental about it. I mean, that's a mantra. They just mantra. They just keep repeating and repeating and repeating, and I think they probably really believe it. But it's not true, okay? <clears throat> They're just talking. As far as science admitting there is no life on other planets, no proof of life on other planets, that's great. I'm glad they admit that. Why don't they admit all we've ever seen is dogs produce dogs, therefore there is no evidence that dogs ever came from something non-dog. If you'd apply that same logic you did to UFOs to the logic from biology, you'd come to, come to the conclusion, God created the original dogs, they've always produced dog kind, and that's all that's ever happened. I mean, that's, that's where science ends. So evolution has nothing whatsoever to do with science. It is not the fundamental doctrine of science. It's a useless theory, and I think counterproductive to science, and I think actually quite dangerous. We teach the kids they're an animal, and then we wonder why they act like animals. No marvel to me. Has the initial ratio of carbon always been the same from birth till now? Question again, initial? Has the initial ratio of carbon always been the same from birth till now? No, the amount of carbon-14, if you're talking about carbon-14, uh, if you're talking about just carbon, I don't think God's created anything new. The Bible says he finished his creation on day six, so everything was done. Uh, the carbon and all the other elements, for that matter, are being you know, rearranged and recycled, but they're not being, nothing's being created. As far as carbon-14, that is being uh, uh, formed by nitrogen being bumped around by neutrons from cosmic radiation. But uh, carbon-14 ratio, uh, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is still increasing. There's actually 37% more carbon-14 now. It, it's in, uh, I've got the stats here, I didn't have any more warning time on these questions. I could get answers up here on my screen. Uh, but uh, I covered that in video number seven, you can get the screen up there, about carbon dating. Uh, carbon is forming faster than it's decaying. I've got uh, evidence right here. Let's see. Plants are always breathing in C14, and the assumption is that carbon-14 is, is already stable in the atmosphere, and therefore we can uh, carbon date things. It's been known for a long time that carbon-14 is not stable. Radiocarbon is still forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying, which means you cannot carbon date anything. You would have to know when it lived to figure out how much carbon it's supposed to have so that you could figure out when it lived. You'd have to already know what you're looking for. There has never been an example where carbon has given the correct date. It always gives wild dates. There's a good book called The Rate Project about that. Uh, when they first invented carbon dating, the lower leg of a mammoth is uh, 15,000 years old, but the skin's 21,000 years old. Same animal. It doesn't get any better. Now here's a living mollusk, 2,300 years old. It's still alive, okay? It, it, it's a useless, uh, useless uh, tool, I think, for science to prove the age of anything. Mr. Callahan, two minutes. If that were true, then that would be the scientific, scientific consensus, just as the consensus is that UF always aren't real. Um, it's not the consensus... And again, you can go over this many points about that on list of creationist arguments. Again, you can go to the links page on my website. And as far as radio, um, radiometric dating, it's been a fantastic tool to date the Earth and fossils. And it's a very powerful argument for evolution and the age of the universe, just as the fossil record is. And again, I remind you of my trilobite. And go to the Natural H Museum of History and the La Brea Tar Pits. By the way, th this is a, trilobite's not a tribble. This is a tribble for all you uh, Star Trek fans. Um, but the uh, radiometric time scale, this is uh, another link on my page, and it discusses the radiometric time scale. And this is by the United States uh, Geological Survey. So are we going to think that the uh, United States Geological Survey is pulling a hoax on us? No, it's what the science says. You study the science carefully, and you can look at, you know, some of the equations and um, the arguments and the various types of dating, including carbon-14. 
And yes, there are things that limit the age and our knowledge, and there are things that might come into play that might corrupt the data, but science carefully examines that. And there's competition among scientists. If somebody published a paper that was obviously in error, a scientist would examine that and say, well, you've, you've made a mistake here because the data was corrupted by this certain um, factor. And no, the, the science is objective. That's what the science says. Carbon-14, along with the other radiometric time scales, are very powerful. And uh, along with the tremendous fossil record and all areas of science, genetics, and we see uh, evolution. As far as dog evolution, it's a question of semantics. We have, you know, um, phylums, genus, family, etc. You can see the Thank many you. Time is up. If one of the laws of thermodynamics says that the universe is always tending towards increasing disorder, then how can you explain the complex ordering in human beings? Okay, the, um, the argument for thermodynamics is, is a weak argument when you study it. It simply says things run down with time, uh, closed systems run down with time towards disorder, and that's because heat is generated. Now, if you have a system that's not closed, then you can, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply. We have massive amounts of energy coming from the sun, and so the Earth is not a closed system. You have massive amounts of energy coming, and you can have increases in complexity. Uh, again, I, I've mentioned many times, but I would ask you to research this yourself. There's some very nice arguments and concise arguments. Go to my website, go to the links page, look at creationist arguments. And the law of thermodynamics, it applies really to physics. It doesn't apply, well, it applies to physics, and it is very specific in that things run down over time in a closed system. But we have an open system, for our, in our case, of energy coming in. So it's very easy to see how life can evolve, which it has. And it's kind of silly to say it hasn't when, when it has. We have overwhelming evidence. It's a very weak argument when you already see the fossil record and these other stronger arguments. And by the way, Dr. Hoban makes the point where well, you only need one evidence. Well, the scientific method, you need to look at many evidences, arguments, and weigh them. And you must resolve the conflicts. And if the Earth's old and the universe, which, which is old, then all the creationist argument, all of them are wrong that say that the Earth is... Um, the Earth is young. They're flawed. They're flawed again, as Dr. Hoven likes to say, in their logic. And so the law of thermodynamics, it's a weak argument, and you can research that yourself. Um, and again, on my list of creationist arguments. Okay, you can get the screen up there. The second law of thermodynamics he's referring to states basically it's numerous different ways it can be stated, but everything tends toward disorder. You leave things alone, they get worse. They don't get better. The Bible teaches that. The heavens are the works of the hands. They perish. They wax old as doth the garment. The left alone, things fall apart. Nothing organizes itself. There's Sue at 20. There she is at 90. <laughs> and there she is at 3,000. Okay? Uh, the second law states, basically, everything collapses, breaks down, wears out, deteriorates. It's falling apart. Okay? Now, his argument that the second law can be overcome by adding energy is absolutely fatally flawed. He'll say the Earth is an open system, which is what he just said, it receives energy from the sun. Well, the universe is a closed system, number one, okay? So there's no new energy being added by definition. Secondly, adding energy is destructive, unless there's something to use the energy. See, the Japanese added a whole bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor. The anniversary of that's coming up in a couple days. They didn't organize nothing for us. A couple years later, we returned the favor and added energy to a few of their cities and didn't organize a thing. See, adding energy to overcome the second law is ludicrous. They'll say, well, you can walk into a room and straighten it up. Yeah, I know, but now you've got, you've got intelligence involved. What he wants to do is add just raw energy and think that's somehow going to do it. That's simply flawed logic, okay? The sun adds energy to your house, but it's going to destroy the roof on your house. The sun's energy will destroy your entire house. If you don't keep fixing things, it's going to completely crumble to dust, okay? The sun's energy will destroy the roof on your car, not build it. It'll destroy the paint job on your car. There's only one thing that can actually use the sun's energy. That's chlorophyll. And each little plant cell is more complex than a space shuttle. So to say adding energy to a primitive earth is going to create life on earth is just ludicrous. Not going to happen. has to be a designer involved. Thank you. Would you like to extend the time? Uh, yes, I'd like to extend Two minutes. It. No, again, it's, it's a law of physics. 
and applied to evolution, it, it just doesn't hold. And as far as a closed system, yes, the universe is closed and it is running down. Eventually all the stars will burn out and all life will die. But the universe is so vast uh, that while it's running down, you can have complexity. And you, have, you can think of hot and cold. And it's the same as when your car is running or your refrigerator, which is also a heat engine. You have, you have heat flowing from um, hot to cold and you have from one area to the other. And while it's flowing, you can do work. When everything becomes the same, which is a very high increase of entropy, then, then you can't. But the universe is running down, stars will burn out. But in the meantime, yes, you can have life. And again, that's the consensus of science. It's what we observe. And it's a weak, ar it's weak argument to say, well, it can't happen when it already has happened and when, when the physics and the science support the contrary. It's a weak argument for um, creation. And again, I would encourage you to um, study that yourself. So that, that is not a valid point as far as uh, creationism. Um, I think I'll start, how much time do I have? I have a minute and a half left. Oh, sorry, 30 seconds. Okay, <laughs> it sounded like it was going backwards. Um, at any rate, can I have a half minute more in my closing? Can we do that instead? Okay. When we get I'll there, we'll talk about the closing. Go ahead. Are you oh, stopping okay. now? Okay, Dr. Hoven, two minutes. Okay. Uh, yes, you keep saying it's a weak argument to say these things because, after all, we're here, so that proves evolution. Well, duh. <laughs> we're here, so that proves Martians put us here, you know. We're here, so that proves we all fell out of a tree. I mean, we're here. I mean, that's not proof of anything, okay? Certainly the fact that we're here doesn't prove evolution. I mean, honestly, come on, think about that one more time. Uh, uh, you said the second law doesn't apply to biology. That is an amazing statement. Uh, I'd like to see how the second law doesn't apply to biology. You still have to have intelligence. I mean, for a baby to grow from, you know, seven or eight pounds to 200 pounds adult, it takes a lot of input of food, and it's not just, not just anything. You don't just pour sand and water in there. It has to be a complex design food, and it has to be used by an extremely complex digestive system, and it's all following a complex code called DNA. This is all a matter of intelligence. This is, these things don't happen automatically. It's true, you can put gasoline in your, in your car and drive down the street and get a very complex machine to work by putting in fuel. Put the fuel in the front seat and toss in a match. See if it does the same thing. Okay? You have to have a complex mechanism to use the energy in the gasoline, called a drivetrain, an ignition system, and all kinds of other things. To say that the sun can shine on the earth and turn a rock to a human in 4.6 billion years is ludicrous. Now, if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you believe. Okay? But don't call it science. And don't make me pay to teach all the kids that in school. That's one of the dumbest religions in the history of the world, and that ought to be taught in private schools at private expense to parents who want their kids to learn that. It shouldn't be forced down the, kid, down the throats of every single kid. But that has to go there. And as far as the refrigerator being an example of violating the second laws, man, oh man. The refrigerator's like 30% efficient if you're lucky, okay? If you have a really high-tech refrigerator, you might be getting 30% efficiency. It's wasted to heat. That's still an example of the second law of thermodynamics. Thank you. All right, for the closing statement, I had two minutes down each. We're going to go ahead and do three for each of you, and we will go in reverse order of the opening statement. So, Mr. Callahan, go ahead, and you have three minutes. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to say again, just very briefly on the second law of thermodynamics. All it says is when you do work, no, no um, machine is 100% efficient. That's why you can't have a perpetual motion machine. It simply says that there's going to be some heat generated in the work. That's all it says. And it says over time you're going to have that wear down. You're going to have more and more heat. And so the universe is closed. Eventually it will become uniform in heat. But while there is the possibility of energy, of, of energy flowing from one to another, from an, one area to another, you can have a complexity. Now as far as my closing uh, statement, and again you can research that yourself, but it's, it's a weak argument. Uh, Again, evolution is just a science. Well, it's a subject for which science has been applied, the scientific method. It's overwhelmingly supported. It is the facts. Anyone that looks at the evidence will come to that conclusion. Um, I want to read, well, let me get to, uh, over here to my 
closing statement here. I have some notes to that effect. Um, you know, the, we ask the world to admit when it's wrong. We need to admit when our, we're wrong and catch up to the scientific age and the age of reason. Jesus is still God, and we know that by overwhelming evidence also. Okay, if, um, you know, the kingdom of God also is within you, you need to know that, the relationship. And see, again, see my website, and I want to read briefly a testimony. This came from um, Bitburg, Germany. I have several out, up here, actually. I just have time to read one very quickly. This is from Bitburg, Germany. Thank you so much for your site. It's awesome. I'm tw I am a... 21-year-old, I live in Bitburg, Germany. I became a Christian a couple years ago. I have been agnostic all my life and have come to recognize the truth of, truth of Christ. Your site was tailor-made for me. I was wondering if I was the only Christian out there with my beliefs. I know Christ is who he says, and I know that science is correct and that God created everything scientists discover, such as physics and evolution. Every Christian I've run into has chastised me for my belief in evolution, etc. I have contemplated many times withdrawing from Christianity, but now I see that I don't need to. I believe that the Bible has many accurate things in it, but also I think many inaccurate things. I know that if something is given by God, he gives proof. I plan to read your book. I am very excited. Five minutes ago, I didn't see my religious future too brightly, but because of your website, I see a wonderful voyage of discovery ahead. You have given me the tools I need for reconciliation. I believe your website is a tool sent from God. Thank you so much. And I have another one here, real brief. I won't have time, but I just wanted to make the point. Uh, I was real excited to find a group that believes in Jesus but does not uh, deny science, including evolution. He goes on excluding evolution. And he's from Trimble, Tennessee. So, my goodness, you can even have a theistic evolution in... in time. All right. Well, I certainly don't deny science. I happen to love science. I just think evolution has got nothing whatsoever to do with it. Let me get the screen back on. Uh, Mr. Callahan's website says, uh, This ministry accepts modern science, including biological evolution and the Big Bang, a valuable yet non-perfect Bible, and a Jesus of history, divine. There are several clear contradictions right in this one statement. If Jesus is divine and he believed in Genesis, and yet you say the Bible's not perfect, you've got a serious problem, as we mentioned earlier. Is it possible for God to use evolution to create the world? Well, it depends what you mean by God, okay? The God that would have to use evolution is cruel, wasteful, stupid, deceitful. He's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure, okay? It's not the character of God to use misfits, blind chance, and death. My God gets it right first time. <coughs> Doesn't have to practice or play around. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection, talking about evolution here, is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is non-selective, one where the weak is protected, which is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. I'm surprised too, by the way. Uh, philosopher David Hull, Northwestern University, said, whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, like... He is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He's not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. I agree. Charles Darwin said, Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. That's Darwin's philosophy, all right. And that's Mr. Callahan's philosophy. Struggle, death, suffering is wonderful because that's how we get ahead. I strongly disagree. My Bible says God's work is perfect. God made it right from the beginning. The God that would use evolution is deceitful. He didn't leave any evidence for evolution behind at all. Nobody ever sees a dog produce a non-dog. That's not what he says in his book. We don't even know how it could happen biologically. Um, so... The Bible says, God, the world were framed by the word of God. In six days, God made everything. He told us clearly and wrote it on a rock in the Ten Commandments, and he rested the seventh day. There are numerous references to the seventh day. The Bible says his works were finished from the foundation of the world, and he rested on the seventh day, the seventh day, which, by the way, is why we have a seven-day week. And there's no stellar, stellar or solar reason for that. The Bible says clearly death came by sin. By man came death. God said, let us make man in our image. So... 
Evolution theory is backwards. If the Bible's true, man brought death into the world. If evolution's true, death brought man into the world. If the Bible's true, God created man. If evolution's true, man created God. Somebody's wrong, folks. Seriously right. wrong. As Dr. Asmussen comes to give his final thoughts, let's give these two gentlemen a hand. Hi, this is Kent Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been traveling doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. My position is very simple. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. And I defend that against all comers. I've had 91 debates against people who believe in evolution. Some of them believe God used evolution. Some are just simply atheists. And you're welcome to watch a lot of those on our videotape series, uh, the debate series on our website, drdino.com. When I was asked to debate John Callahan, he had written me and uh, emailed me and called me a couple times, said he believed that God used evolution to get us here, and he was just very concerned that what I was teaching was wrong. And I talked to him on our radio program a couple times, our daily radio program at drdino.com. You can see that on the Creation Science Hour. It plays 5 to 6 Central Time. It's live. Anybody can call in with questions. I was really honored to debate him because I think what he's teaching is simply not, not only wrong, but dangerous. What kind of a God would use the evolution theory? What kind of a God would use this process to get us here? I mean, that's a cruel, wasteful, uh, evil God that doesn't know what he wants and wants to use suffering and death and misfits. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. So I don't do this out of any malice toward any particular person, but more toward a position of what they teach. I, I am for truth and against error, wherever it comes from. And we have a lot of materials that should help strengthen your faith and teach about creation and uh, evolution and answer all kinds of questions about the Garden of Eden. You can check our website, Dr. Dino, where we have lots of information available, or our radio program. Uh, Mr. Callahan's main argument is the stars are billions of light years away, therefore the universe is billions of years old. We didn't get to cover that much in the debate, but we do cover that quite a bit on videotape number seven, our question-answer tape, as well as on my website. His other argument that he uses all the time is majority opinion. All scientists believe this, therefore it must be true. That, of course, is a lousy reason to believe anything, just because everybody else believes it. And secondly, of course, they don't all believe that. Most people believe in creation. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this debate. Uh, I'll be glad to debate any professors or anyone who believes in evolution anytime. You can check our website, Dr. Dino, and get my itinerary. And if I'm going to be in your area, if you can contact local professors and say, hey, would you be willing to have a panel discussion or a debate on the subject of creation, I'll be glad to do it at their university. I typically pay professors $200 if they'll debate me and then a quarter million dollars if they can prove the evolution theory is true. We are really convinced that God's word is absolutely flawless and correct in every detail, and we want you to believe it too. Hello, this is John D. Callahan of faithreason.org. I hope you enjoyed the debate. Dr. Hoban claimed that symbiosis supports creationism. Actually, it's the exact opposite. The cheetah and the gazelle are going to evolve symbiotically to hunt and evade. As far as apes evolving into man, it became advantageous for certain apes to live on the ground because forests were retreating, and this sparked the evolution of man. Of Earth and life scientists, approximately 99.5% support evolution, and this is a valid appeal to authority. As far as the second law of thermodynamics, it is true that the universe is running down and entropy is increasing as a whole. However, local increases in complexity occur all the time, including nature, and evolution is not prevented by the second law of thermodynamics. Most importantly, God is good. And Dr. Hoven asked, how could a good God allow evolution? Because there is suffering and death in evolution. My answer, as I pointed out in the debate, is that the fall of Satan and his angels occurred before the Big Bang. Now, I know this is mind-challenging, but so are relativity and quantum mechanics. However, if it turns out to be true, based on the evidence, then it is true. There is no reason that the spiritual universe could not also be vast and mind-boggling, just as the physical universe is vast and mind-boggling. Thank you, and please see faithreason.org.